Hello and welcome to Shaman Sister Sessions, episode 38. I'm Michelle Hawk and I'm here with my shaman sister, Catherine Bird. This podcast was born out of our friendship, our sisterhood, and our years of having amazing discussions about what it means to be a practitioner on the path. Thank you so much for joining us. This is our great joy to offer to you and include you in our discussions as we love philosophizing about various aspects of what does it mean to be a shaman? What does it mean to do this work in the world? What are the implications for us personally, professionally, and on the global scale? Today we are so excited to speak about animal guides and teachers. It's so funny when we were talking a couple of weeks ago about what we were going to speak about today, I realized we hadn't spoken about animal guides at all and it struck us both as almost comical given that this is such a huge component of both of our work, especially of mine, and it seemed as though we had somehow overlooked this glaringly obvious topic. So we decided absolutely it is long overdue that we talk about animal guides and teachers. Absolutely. So you're, yeah, you're joining us for a wonderful episode today, a topic about which we both have a lot to say, a lot of amazing experiences. And, uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm excited. I love talking about animal guides. Yeah. And this is our episode. Oh, Google, sorry. My light just fell down. <laughs> Um, goodness. Okay. Are you okay? Yeah, it didn't. Hold on, hold on. My sure. technical difficulty. Okay. Oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> I need help. Hold on. That's okay. Uh, I was funny. I was just wondering, like, oh my gosh, did a bird fly? You know, speaking of animals, did a, a bird, like, very dramatically make its presence known and fly into your house or fly into a window or something? But, oh my gosh, yeah, it sounded like it. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> so, this is our episode 38, which is one of the reasons why we were like, oh my gosh, we haven't even talked about animal guides yet. And we are very excited. As of this week, we will have all of our prior episodes up on both iTunes and Stitcher. So um, if you are a fan of our show, um, we would so appreciate you just like tuning into iTunes or Stitcher and giving us a review or rating because that will really help us um, have a greater reach. Um, so we're very excited about that. That's been kind of in works, in progress for a while. And um, because I took a month off of work, I was able to <laughs> do some work. I don't know. That wasn't really what my intention was, but it got done. And so episode 38, it wasn't really a month off. It wasn't really. A month. Yeah. So episode 38 and we haven't talked about animal guides. And one of the, one of the reasons that this is so um, interesting is because our first collaborative venture together was called animal dance, a shamanic animal experience in which Michelle and I collaborated with um, creating a, uh, a shamanic animal experience utilizing drum journeying to retrieve animal guides and doing a immersive merge with the animal, dancing the animal, and then receiving the medicines and the wisdoms of the animals and even creating an animifesto of what the animal wants to show up and help you create in the world, which was a extremely fun and valuable and um, fascinating um, offering that we did and mm -hmm. in numerous places. And yeah. yeah, so that was yeah, that was a few years ago. And as Kat shared, that was our very first collaborative adventure together where Kat and I had known each other for a while and we decided, hey, I want to work with you. Okay, I want to work with you too. What can we do? And we found this very natural fit of, uh, you know, particularly my work with the animals and Kat's work with embodiment. And of course, we both did both, but, you know, we had our strengths in those areas and merging them together in this super fun workshop that we have taken all over the place and to various gatherings, uh, a few festivals, as well as um, teaching, you know, here in Portland, teaching in the San Diego area, and just having a lot of fun with it. So it, it's so funny that we haven't talked about animal guides until just now. Yeah, and and I 
I'm, yeah, and definitely the first uh, direct experience that I had of your work, I believe was coming to one of your animal, uh, animal journey channeling uh, workshops where you led people through um, retrieving power animals and um, working with their energy and learning from them. Mm -hmm. uh, which I loved and, and really loved that experience. And, uh, and I don't know if everyone knows this or not, but Michelle is a animal shaman. And even though a lot of her work has really moved into working with the human realm, that especially the earlier work that she was doing, very focused on animals, on both real life animals because Michelle is a genius with animals where she, you can, your dog can call her on the phone and she can tell you everything that's going on with your dog. And, <laughs> and, um, and then also with the spirit animals and really connecting to spirit animals and to um, energies of animals and being able to channel animal energies, which I haven't actually seen much of in the world um, of, of people who actually do that work to the depth that you're able to do it. It's, it's really profound. It's, it's super interesting. And, um, you know, I, I think that probably you're one of the, I, I would definitely consider you one of the top experts in the realms of, you know, animal communication and animal energetics and, and working with, with animals in general. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that I wholeheartedly and gratefully receive that reflection. This has been animals animals were my first teachers. So just to give people a little bit of a background about uh, it has always made sense to me that animals on the physical level and on the energetic level are divine embodied beings just as humans are. And it was, I was one of those kids who had all the animal friends and who played with the dogs and the cats and the horses. And uh, I had some human friends too, but I definitely connected much more easily with the animals. As many children naturally do, we we're drawn to them. I always wanted to read the stories about animals, the stories that I spent my time reading. You know, I was reading up several grade levels because I wanted to read the books about horses right? Because that was what really intrigued me. I, for many years, I wasn't even interested in working with humans. It was only relatively recently, like in the last, well, actually, I mean, I've been working with humans for several years now at this point, but for the first several years of my practice, I had absolutely nothing to do with humans at all. And I was totally cool with that. This is something that uh, is still a part of my work. I'll always work with animals and animal guides continually show up in my work with humans, but I, you know, it's my, the flavor of my work has definitely changed. So what are animal guides? Kat, you said that that was one of your first experiences of coming to uh, experience my work. Do you remember what your animal guide was from that workshop by any chance? From that workshop, it was a heron. Cool. Yeah. So I, I believe a blue, it was blue heron. Mm -hmm. Um, cause you know, I always get the birds. <laughs> yep. I like, I have like flocks of birds traveling around with me. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So what are our animal guides? You know, pe and it's funny cause people ask me all the time, you know, when they hear I work with animal guides, they say, Oh, well, what's your spirit animal? What's your power animal? And you know, Kat, it's funny you mentioned the flocks of birds. We all have so many animal guides. It's not, first of all, it's not even funny just how many animal guides we have. Second of all, why on earth would you only have one, right? When we are work, we are infinitely com complex, continually changing, shifting beings, going through different energies, different phases in our lives. Just as you have a whole team of spirit guides, you have a whole team of resources and teachers on your side coaching you through and guiding you through your life, you have so many animal guides who are showing up to share their medicine with you. And granted, part they'll be highlighted at different points in your life or in different circumstances, but I guarantee you, you have more than one animal guide, first of all. Yeah. And so then, again, in this... In this um 
in this vein of what is an animal guide? Like what, what does it mean to have, like, what does it mean to have an animal guide or a, a spirit animal or a power animal? Um, are all of those terms uh, correlative? Are they, are we saying the same things only we're not sure that we're saying the same thing sometimes? Yeah, I use those terms fairly interchangeably. So animal guide, spirit animal, power animal, animal totem also. They, I, I would say, um, you know, of course, then there's the general like, okay, an animal guide, any animal guide versus my animal guide versus this is my animal totem. So this might be a physical representation of a spirit animal who has appeared to me, who is my spirit animal, right? The uh, this is something that is ubiquitous across humanity. This is something that is not unique to any particular culture, any particular tribe, any particular religion. Every group of, I feel pretty safe saying this, every group of indigenous people across the globe has honored the spirits of different animals and uh, the energy of different animals for their unique properties for their unique medicine. So people ask me, well, where is this tradition from? Or where did you learn this tradition? I say, this isn't an, any particular lineage thing. This is something that is ubiquitous to all of humanity. We are deeply connected to animals in the physical realm. Think about humans initially, uh, you know, corresponding with animals and domesticating animals, also having experiences with wild animals. And that the animals in the immediate surroundings would inform the deity experiences and and deifying animals having the um you know spiritism animism uh which is kind of the root of spiritual tradition the root of shamanism is seeing life seeing god seeing spirit in the world around you and it was very natural then to see god to see spirit in the form of animals so there was the deification of the animal energies and honoring okay honoring sacred salmon for example here in the pacific northwest especially honoring um you know as you go into central and south america honoring jaguar honoring um, boa constrictor, python, honoring Quetzal, right? Uh, as you go into like the uh, Asian steppe, the Mongolian steppe, honoring golden eagle. This is one of the apex predators of that area. In Africa, honoring lion as an apex predator, honoring, you know, these different animals. Um, seeing the physical representation of the animal and honoring it for its energetic qualities, for the feeling that it imbues for the energy that it carries and elevating that to the deification level, the archetypal level, that's where we get the idea of the animal guide. So yes, this is a wolf, a physical wolf that you see. We see the, um, the embodied representation of wolf energy and also we can connect with the energetic spirit level wolf that embody that exhibits this quality this quality this quality so that's what we're referring to when we talk about animal guides or spirit animals power animals is the archetypal representation of an energy that is mirrored in the physical realm love that thanks for that went in a big circle there but i came back around <laughs> it's, it's it's you know i think it's a much needed definition because Although we are all fascinated in a certain way with animals, I know I've always held a extreme fascination with animals, um, even as a child. And uh, but but we're a little bit disconnected from the um, you know the reality of of our our ancestors of being vulnerable to predators of being uh vulnerable to starving if you don't actually aren't actually able to track and know an animal from the inside out and develop a, an innate knowledge of its experience in order to be able to hunt and in order to be able to fish in order to be able to feed your family and then utilizing all of those parts of the animal we're so disconnected from our food uh, system that using all those parts of the animal to clothe ourselves, to make tools, to uh, make our shelters, to make our sacred tools and objects, all of these pieces that we, we 
had been and do see in certain cultures still today utilizing animals and when we are in possession of a animal object i have a lot of um you know antlers and horns and skins and and skulls and so on and so forth and wings in my home and when we're in in possession of that then we are able to truly feel a great amount of energy from it and then if we are taking that even further and perhaps you know working with the dead animal or having having kids Oh. Then we are, you know, able to have an even deeper, more profound relationship with that particular animal and animal spirit. And in many cultures, um, going through the process of becoming a mm -hmm. um, an adult involves doing vision quest work of working in whatever way that that particular culture did it. Uh, its work and oftentimes uh, being visited by an animal, either a real life animal or a vision of an animal that would then be offering its power to that person for its life and then informing that person and becoming part of its that person's personality in a certain kind of way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to um, go back a little bit to, you know, this is all a part of the how do we interact with our animal guides and how do we find out who our animal guides are and what are different means of relating with them. But um, again, it's, I, I want to backpedal a little bit. So we have the archetypal energetic representation of a guide and it's, I have a lot of people ask me, Kat, and maybe you do too. Um, people ask me, so is it like a spirit guide or like what, you know, what is its function really? Let's talk about that a little bit where I would say, yes, it is. You know, if you think about like, okay, yes, it is another face of a spirit guide, but why do we care about animal guides? Why do we care about our spirit animals for sure? And what is their function? And I'm kind of curious. I know you have some really interesting stories of ways in which animals have appeared to you and how they're affecting your experience. And I do too, for sure. I'll share some of those too. Well, I mean, you know, animals show up. They, uh, a lot of times people are like, well, how do I know? And then once you start making that inquiry, it's like they just start showing up. And animals have very specific flavors and frequencies that they, their powers are of a certain kind. And when we can tune into that animal's power, um, and it is said that an animal actually shares its power with you uh, willingly. And that if we can make that connection from gratitude and, and receive that power, we start to gain that power, information, knowledge about ourselves, about the world, about how maybe we can be in the world, maybe ways of being that we've overlooked within ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, different animals give us different messages on maybe being courageous or being kind and compassionate or being quiet or being extreme and, and showy and ostentatious a little bit, getting out of our box. They're giving us these permissions and messages to explore aspects of ourselves that maybe we haven't tuned into yet or we've lost or that are an important part of us bringing our gift to the world, I believe. Absolutely. Yeah. And I would say people who are interested in working with their animal guides, and this is a conversation that we have, it, the animal guides, yes, will show up. There are a few different ways to go about accessing the energy of animals. So um, what I generally or what generally happens with me is I don't even have to ask, they just kind of show up because I think, you know, that has to do with a contract that I set unconsciously a very long time ago or, you know, before I was born maybe. And animals have always just been very present in my life in exactly the perfect time and exactly the perfect 
perfect way because I don't even have to ask and I receive the support that I need in the form of a certain guide or, or an animal who is initiating me into a new way of being. So they'll show up. That's number one is an animal will just appear to you. You know, maybe it'll be all of a sudden you start seeing tigers everywhere. Like somebody has a tiger t-shirt and then somebody has a tiger poster on the wall and then you have a dream with a tiger and then you see an article online about tigers or whatever and all of a sudden tigers are surrounding you. That's one way in our modern world where we're not, you know, out living in the area where we can interact with the physical tigers. That's one way that tiger medicine can appear to us and tigers trying to get your attention. So you sit with tiger, you talk with tiger and ask, why are you appearing to me? It'll give you a message. You can also go research online or look in a book. Uh, we can come to that later about what, you know, we're going to talk about how to work with your animal guide. But another way of being or another way of acquiring or finding out who your animal guide is uh, in a particular circumstance, maybe you want to consciously ask for help from a certain guide. Maybe you say, for example, I would really like some support in developing my stillness. So, you know, Kat, you uh, said your quietness, right, or your stillness, right? So maybe you call upon um, a rabbit, for example. So you call upon a prey animal who part of their gift, part of their magic is knowing when to be still, knowing when to be very still and very quiet and present, like very completely present and aware of their surroundings in a very quiet way. So you might consciously ask rabbit to come into your life as a totem and teach you the gift of stillness and presence, perhaps. Or maybe you want to go stillness from another way. Maybe you want to go with, um, I don't know, cheetah, for example, a predator animal who is also very still, and but from a discernment and knowing when to pounce, knowing when to start running sort of way, rather than the the prey side you know that's another thing too that i can talk about for a long time is like the predator prey interactions of the animals and the interactions of the animals in the food chain and where they are and how they relate to each other there's this whole I, yeah clearly because michelle heard. also has a background as a biologist and yeah. has uh intensely studied animal behavior for mm -hmm. a long time and um so yes this this topic, we could probably spend like three hours today on this yes. topic. So we're gonna try to get as much uh, as much usable information to you as possible today. Um, mm -hmm. So still in this realm of, so we've been talking about, okay, well, what is an animal guide? Why do we want to have an animal guide um, or connect to animals in this kind of way? And so it can be, you're saying, um, maybe I'm trying to bring bring out in a certain aspect of my personality that maybe I you know need to work on, and this animal is going to support me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, another way that I see animals supporting us, animal guides supporting us, is that oftentimes uh, a animal guide will will accompany us. Uh, as uh, shamans, they will accompany us as we journey um through the other realms with other poor people or in sessions or for ourselves they're protectors in the astral plane and um offer guidance and, and support and sort of help us find our way and in, in a lot of ways so a lot of shamans have very um <clears throat> very strong connections with certain animal guides which help them <clears throat> to kind of show the way or protect or receive power when uh, they're doing the shamanic work that they're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, working with them in the astral plane, absolutely powerful allies. The, um, oh, I might have, I lost it. I was gonna say something else and I lost it. Um, no, I'll come back, I'll think of it later. So why else do we want to work with uh, animals, animal guides? Animal guides are some of the easiest to access, I would say. Easier, it, it's very biocompatible, for example, where, uh, you know, we had in a few, couple episodes ago, we had Amateo on as a guest. And for those of you who missed it, that was a fantastic episode okay. where we spoke, of, huh? Check that one out. And we talked about galactics. So we talked about yeah. aliens. 
Yeah. So we spoke about, uh, right. It, you know, totally different, like opposite end of the spectrum working with galactics and, um, you know, where there's a certain level of compatibility there, compatibility of consciousness. And yet animals, I would say even more so in many ways, because we live on the same planet as the physical embodiment of these animal archetypes. Um, we, have evolved alongside them for many years. We've come into partnership with certain animals through domestication, um, you know, predator and prey animals. So we have really close ties with many animal allies in, um, in terms of how we consume them for our food. We are made up of animal parts, you know, unless you're, you've, been a vegan throughout all of your entire lineages, which I promise you have not, because <laughs> some of your ancestors ate meat at some point, even if you have been a hardcore vegan. So you have animal in you, like parts of other animals, and they have parts of other animals in them, right? So we are physically composed of the same material. We share the same planet. We uh, return to the same earth when our bodies die. So there is I would say animal guides are some of the easiest to access. If you want to start working with archetypal energies or you want to start working with channeling energies or um, discovering who your guides are, start with the animals. They'll make it super easy. And they're not only easy, but they're safe. So a lot of people, um, as uh, I'm sure that you work with, Michelle, uh, we, people start opening their channels and they start like uh, information and beings and things start coming in. And there's oftentimes a question of, is this safe? How do I know? What's, you know, what am I bringing in? What should I be focusing on? Animals are very safe. They're, they're a safe go-to. And oftentimes, as you are having a spiritual awakening, you will start receiving animal guides that are there to support the spiritual awakening that you're having or certain gifts are coming online. So I have these huge chill bumps that are just like all over my body. So it's, it's important for us to connect to these animal guides. I believe if, if we are going to be connecting to the higher realms, to guides and angels, beings of light, galactic beings, all of these beings that are up here, to also, as part of our grounding practice even, our earth-based practice to have a connection to at least one animal guide that is supporting us in that other realm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's it's fun to do a lot of the airy fairy work, you know, and I love that too. Absolutely. I love working with the galactics. I love working with the angels, the archangels and the spirit guides, very high vibration. And also there is something to be said for working with a guide who has a counterpart that is physically embodied on the same planet as you, that is an anchor. It's, you know, there's a reason why shamanism is an earth-based series of practices. You know, it's kind of a, um, the word shamanism refers to a very broad spectrum of practices that have uh, developed over thousands and thousands of years, the oldest spiritual practices on earth that have their roots in earth-based deification and spiritism, right? So animals, if you think about it, are some of the original deities, right? You know, you have the animals, you have the elementals, the trees, right? The Everything that you see around you, think about the, the very first development of a spiritual practice. It was like, well, life is sacred. And so life comes from all these things around us and all these things are alive. All these animals are alive, so they are sacred. So it's the, some of the first sacred that you see around you is animals. And it's a very anchoring, very grounded cat, as you said, very safe experience working with animal energies. Right. I have not ever encountered personally and not ever heard of anyone having a messed up experience working with an animal guide. <laughs> Never. Um, you know, and, and because we can see it all over, right? We can see it in the hieroglyphs of Egypt. We can see it in the totem poles. We can see it in... Um, you know, all of the cave drawings, we can see it everywhere that animals are, are vital to our almost, they're almost vital to our humanness. So yeah. okay, why else? We are two animals. We there's are a, animals. There's also, the, there's this idea of separation. We're not separate. 
Not at all. We are, these are our brothers and sisters. These are our closest relatives in the galaxy, in the universe, right? And so there's this idea of, okay, well, part of the reason that they're so easy for us to work with archetypally is because we're composed of, you know, very astonishingly similar genetic material. I mean, across the board, just think about, you have a whole universe full of, um, you know, not even physical genetic material. You have soul DNA like all over the place, right? And you have this planet full of beings where your closest relatives, even if you look at, oh, I'm not really super close to a, um, you know, a paramecium or whatever, but I promise you're a lot closer to a paramecium than you are to a, you know, who knows whatever else, like in, <laughs> you know what I mean though, right? Yeah. Well, for sure. I mean, even genetically, we can see like our, our, our genetic code is so similar to a mouse. Um, yeah. <laughs> very similar. So we Good. are, we are vitally connected through life force. Um, so why else yeah. do you care about animal um, spirit guides? I think that another reason that we really should be working with and caring about animal spirits is because we are in an environmental crisis at this moment. Yeah. And we are in a witness of what they are stating is the sixth great extinction, wherein uh, animal species all over the planet are going extinct at an alarming rate. Mm -hmm. And by connecting to animal spirits, we are, you know, we're fortifying our connection with, um, with species that are, are dying out and gaining wisdom from animals that might not be here yeah. in another 10, 20, 50 years. Yeah. It's a, it's a two way street for sure. So yes, we are receiving from these animal guides. They are offering us their, their medicine. They're offering us their energy, their teachings. And also in doing so, we're forming a really very strong cementing a soul contract with them where we are, we are in commitment. We're living in relationship with them, right? Relationship where, you know, imagine you have a really strong tie with the elephants for example, as I do, I have a strong tie with the elephants. And so I, I care deeply about elephant rights. And I've, um, you know, been in conversation with elephant preservation organizations. And when we have these deep ties with the archetype of the animal, we inherently care that much more deeply about the physical embodiment of that animal. And it's a way of being in service to these guides that have offered so much to us. So it goes both ways. And in that same going both ways, by our embodying, <clears throat> like we did an animal dance, we actually merged with the animal and allowed the animal to move through us to feel its hair and its claws and its feathers, its scales, to see through its eyes, to, to voice its call out, to allow it to move through us, to give it physical form to this spirit we are also allowing, we are giving it some of our power as well. We are sharing in this relationship, we're building relationship and we are also feeding it some of our energy and our, um, you know, our, our deep gratitude and, and appreciation for being allowed to have that kind of experience inside of a human body is one of the most fascinating and rewarding things that we can do, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a uh, part of what another face of what we talk about in our animal dance workshop is, Kat, you mentioned already the anima festo. Mm -hmm. When, and I would say this goes across the board whenever you're working with any spirit guide or you're coming into contract with any guide or teacher is yes, how are they serving you? How are they offering to you? But also how are you offering to them? And how uh, why did they, this is a, a question that we talk about as part of animal dance, but why did this guide choose you to work with? Because, you know, no, for example, no elephant guide is 
the same as any other, I know my, my name is Michelle Hawk, right? It, you know, that's sort of a series of initiations. Um, and so why did Hawk appear to me? What particular service can I offer to this energy, to this archetype? And what soul contract do I have to be in service to that animal as well? That's a, a very important consideration when working with any guide, animal guide, otherwise, etc. that I highly encourage you to sit with of how are you serving the archetype? How are you serving your contract with that guide as well? That's great, Michelle. Um, can let's talk a little bit about uh, a little bit of how of how this works, of different okay. ways that we see that we're able to work with animal guides. Mm -hmm. um, maybe so. There's lots of ways to work with animal guides, and maybe you're just like Michelle said. You're realizing, oh my gosh, this animal is showing up everywhere, and I'm I'm drawing a card, and there's an animal, this particular yeah. animal, and then I'm seeing it, and then. It's kind of everywhere for me right now. And then what do I do with that? Like, okay. Mm. And as you suggested, just sitting with it and just asking, okay, what, do you, right. what are you here for? What are you here to teach me? What are we here to do together in that sort of animifesto kind of way of like, what are we here to create in this world with your help and assistance? What do I need to know right now from mm -hmm. you? Like really getting curious and asking these questions. A lot of us have animals that we feel very deeply connected to, maybe for our entire lifetime. And we rarely sit and just ask the questions of them of why are you in my life and what are you here to teach me? What am, am I here to do in the world with the assistance of you? Uh -huh. I want to tell a story that I don't think I've told on this podcast before, so hopefully it's new, but if you've heard it before, bear with me. This was one of the more dramatic encounters I've had with an animal announcing itself into my life in a rather surprising way. Um, I have had, you know, I've had various dramatic sorts of encounters, but this one is one of my favorite because it was so surprising to me and sort of unpleasant, right? And I, I should say, not all of our animal initiations are pleasant, beautiful, amazing experiences. Some are dealing with powerful. That's the other thing. Oh, I remember what I wanted to say um, earlier. Yes, animals are safe. Yes, animals are easy. That does not make them any less powerful. It does not make them any less on whatever hierarchy of guidance of spirit guides or teachers. They're some of the most powerful medicine that I know of comes from little tiny, tiny animals who pack a mega punch and they're here to initiate you into some very amazing medicine. I was bitten by a black widow spider a few weeks ago. So I will tell you that a tiny, tiny animal can pack a big punch. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and I'm actually, I'm going to tell my spider story. So yeah, I'm just going to use spider medicine. This took place almost exactly two years ago, actually. And I, we had one of those big super moons. It was a super moon in August. I put all of my crystals, and for those of you who know me, you know that's a lot of crystals. I put them all out in the backyard so they could soak in the moonlight, the light of this beautiful super moon. I blew up my air mattress, uh, my camping air mattress, and I was sleeping outside with my crystals in the moonlight in my backyard, minding my own business, only to be awoken around three o'clock in the morning by a spider biting my lip. I, I, I believe it was my top lip. Yeah, it was my top lip spider biting me right here. And Kat, I know that, that's a point that you like to tell us this is the I remember point right yeah so I have I remember right here at this point so I had a spider bite me right on my lip at that I remember point and it's funny because a couple of years ago I hadn't um I hadn't spoken with you about that yet so I don't I didn't know that piece but now in light of that it makes even more sense so I, I remember I woke up with this, just this jab of pain right there and I said out loud, who does that? Like talking to the spider, I actually said to the spider, who does that? I'm just here sleeping, minding my own business. Like, how dare you? And so I, I rolled over and I went back to sleep. And I woke up the next morning and my lip was super puffy. I could barely talk. I was kind of drooling and it was, it was like really swollen. I was having a reaction to it. But 
through my magic of detox and, uh, and all the stuff that I do is able to reduce the swelling after a few hours. The next day I left to go participate in a traditional native American dance ceremony where I was, you know, I was outside all day starting in the wee hours of the morning dancing and my particular little zone that I had set up to rest in happened to be right under this hatching of baby spiders. So I, at some point I look down and I see I'm covered in these tiny, tiny, like little itty bitty baby spiders and I'm trying to transport them off of me and put them on the bushes around me so they don't get squashed and just have these little baby spiders kind of running around all over. And so at this point I see that something's up and I ask, hey, grandmother spider, what's up with this? You're sending your grandchildren to come bite me and to come crawl all over me. And, uh, and I received some really powerful downloads about spider medicine where she told me spider medicine is about storytelling. Spider webs are the, the origins of the runes. It said that the runes, the very first characters for language, came from the shapes in spider web. So she is the original storyteller. Think of weaving the yarn of a story. She weaves the threads of life into a tail, into a cohesive tail. The, um, the shape of her web is a spiral. So the spiral of time, it's moving like the story of life throughout all space and time, and the shape of the body is the infinity. So all of these aspects of storytelling and timelessness and, um, and grasping the infinite nature of life and sharing that through the story that I received in a direct infusion of medicine into my I remember point on my lip. So a bite in shamanic tradition being bitten by an animal is an initiation into medicine of that animal. So I received a, a bite directly on my lip. Tell the stories. I remember. I remember the stories of infinite nature of life and space and time. And that was two years ago. And that's when I really picked up my game of writing. I was writing a lot before then, but after that, much more writing and storytelling and speaking publicly about my work, speaking about my practice, and Spider appeared in this very beautiful, startling way to initiate me into storytelling medicine. Amazing. I love that. So, mm -hmm. so good. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that that really goes to show us this, you know, that an animal can show up and sometimes in not a way that you really want an animal to show up and um, can be sending you messages and bringing you messages that oftentimes for a lot of people would be just like, ah, spiders and ah, there's spiders all over me. Ah, this is horrible. Um, and just, you know, be kind of upset by that experience or, or whatever. And not actually just ask the question, hey, what's this all about? Why are you giving me this experience right now? Kind of like with everything in life, you know, might as well stop and ask the question, why am I having this experience right now? Mm -hmm. um, and animals are are really strong in that way um, and they will just show up I even at my light warrior retreat in the evening we were had we were in the yurt and we were all sitting and having soup and having this you know convert deep conversations around spirituality and healing and all of these things and I've, I've lived on this property for two years and I've never seen a scorpion and this big scorpion just rushes right into the middle of the room just like hi everybody <laughs> what's going on here <laughs> you know mm -hmm. and scorpions are usually kind of they're they're off doing their own thing they're not like i want to come right into the middle of the room of people like so everyone can see me and you know with that we get to sit and go okay so what are you here to bring to this conversation what what are you here to witness in this conversation that we're having? What's mm -hmm. the medicine and the magic that you're bringing into our lives right now? What can we receive from you? Uh -huh. um, and then we start having different experiences of maybe even animals that we've had fear around or hatred of or being grossed out by. We're like, oh, actually, you're here to teach me something. Cool. 
Yeah, that's a huge, important point of what value do we place on different animals? I used to be terrified of spiders for no particularly good reason, but I remember as a kiddo just for whatever reason, they scared the shit out of me. And it was only after I lived in Costa Rica and I got in the habit of seeing these really significantly large spiders that it took the edge off of my anxiety. And But I think also some of that discomfort, thinking back to it now, was there a layer of fear there that I had around being open about telling my story? Was there some barrier resistance that I had to uh, to really communicating and being very transparent and forthcoming as a leader in this particular community, as a person who since that initiation, part of my medicine has been around committing myself to being very transparent and telling the story of myself uh, as a way of being in commitment to this journey that I'm on. So maybe years and years ago that, but that I wasn't ready for that. And that was part of what scared me about spider. I love that. Um, yeah. I want to hear a story. Kat, I know you've had some really amazing experiences with various animal guides. I'm wondering, what's up your sleeve That's that you want to share? I don't even know what story we want to hear. Um, which story do you want to hear about animals? Mm. I know you've got a good one about fox. You know, one of my more um, in, yeah, probably a little bit more of my more intense shamanic experiences was with fox medicine and um, receiving the fox. And uh, at this same time, I, I, I received a couple of animals and, you know, it's not likely that this is definitely going to happen to everybody, but in this particular way, um, I, was in, um, I was in the forest in a uh, very deep trance experience. And so a lot of times when we say, how do we work with animals, um, allowing yourself to enter into a trance state in whatever way that you can connect to that. So Michelle will often use um, drumming um, and actually traveling down into the underworld where the animal spirits live in order to retrieve an animal guide. Um, so drumming, singing, dancing is always one that I've used um, to enter into a trance state uh, some people just can sit and enter into a trance state, but <laughs> a lot of times it takes something repetitive that you do for a while in order to actually shift your consciousness um, to be able to be open to what is is there. And I did have the fox actually as I I'm I'm there and I'm I'm dancing and I'm singing and. The fox came, and I could feel all around the the forest this movement, like shoo, 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 shoo. and then it came from around behind, up and through my body, and like from from behind me into my body, and I was completely transformed. It didn't last for an extremely long period of time. But it was, it was an awareness of something that we are not allowed access to very often and uh, was definitely one of my initiations in how that I could utilize these uh, trans experiences that I was cultivating in order to um, welcome, because I was having channeling experiences this is when my channel was first opening, but actually allowing an animal to enter in and then receiving that medicine and, um, you know, receiving that medicine of, of, of being hidden in plain sight, of being able to see, you know, through the darkness in a certain kind of way of, of infinite play and, and joy and like curiosity and, um, the, it, it was absolutely one of the most fascinating experiences of my entire life of, to that point, to be able to be given access to, 
uh, another being's perception and reality and to have a merge experience with another being uh, and just the awareness the 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 sensory awareness that animals have um like everything was so heightened within my my system like i it was like i could feel the this hair and like every hair was an antenna, like everything was alive and how alive that animals are. And it really left me with this sense of wonder and awe and extreme gratitude and, and a heightened sense of my own sensitivities, of how sensitive that I am and that that it was actually good because at that point as i was starting to open things up a lot of my sensitivities i had been blocking and i had been shutting down and i had been not allowing myself to have all of my sensitivities because it felt too much it felt overwhelming it felt like no i don't want to be that and this having access to this expanded state gave me a greater allowance of my own sensitivity of my own presence with what it means to be taking in information and aware of my surroundings and aware of what's going on all around me all the time that i had never allowed myself to have because it felt like too much. And I think that this was a, a, a radical shift and, and it was also just super joyful and fun and, and you know, in this, this sense of wonder and, and play that I, like, yeah, this is, okay. it's okay. It's okay to be super sensitive and to utilize that for your own wonderment and play. And, um, and it, it doesn't have to be something that's, you know, so heavy and um, discouraging as I had taken it on to be, I think, at that point. Yeah. That's um, super powerful. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> uh, so I, I also do want to touch on um, how, like, okay, we're like, okay, well, what is this animal guide and why do we want to do it? And, and a little bit about how, so we talked about going into trance state. We talk about um, mm -hmm. doing drum journeys. And this is something that Michelle is amazing at. And, um, you know, I don't, Michelle, do you still do uh, animal journey workshops? I don't do workshops anymore because, I really want to work with people diving in deeper. Yeah. So I actually don't really advertise this, but this is something that if people work with me one-on-one, -on -one, we can do as part of our one-on-one -on -one work more in depth uh, in the form of either like, well, this is in the context of what we'll, we'll do journey work as part of our healing work or mentorship work together. And then I also have this whole series of animal guide specific offerings that I've never told anybody about, but I created. I was like, well, here are these amazing things that I've done with animal guides that I want to do with other people. So they're ready for whenever anyone comes along and is ready to do that. Uh, and to all of you watching and listening, I would encourage you, if that's something that you are interested in diving in really deep, I've got it ready for you and I'm ready when you are. I love that. I love that you have a program that you don't tell anybody about. I have two. You're just waiting for someone to show up and go, this is what I want. Exactly. I've, yep, I've got two animal guide specific programs ready yeah. to dive in super deep. So. Yeah, and I know for me, a lot of times if I'm doing an, a hands-on healing work session, that there will be specific animals that will kind of just show up in the room <laughs> for that person. And they might have a message or they might just be like, I'm just letting you know that I'm here. Um, and so for our healers, I know we have a lot of healers out there just to start being coming, like when we're in session with somebody and we just start to go, so are there any animals here? <laughs> um, sometimes they will come into our consciousness 
when mm -hmm. maybe we didn't know that they were there before or as we we're doing other things or we're working on energy we're doing whatever we're doing um they're there and sometimes it just takes that like hey are there any sometimes i will i will very much as part of because I, I like through the session especially towards the end to really be asking like how can this person integrate what you know how what support are they receiving and a lot of times an animal you know is there an animal that's showing up for this person right now and a lot of times an animal will be showing up for that person who is supporting them through whatever it is that they're going through i also work with animal essences which are flower essences that have been specifically um infused with an animal energy and so i use those with my clients as well and for journey work and have you know always just really appreciated the animal support as healers that we can call on specific animals in our sessions to help with things that are happening so um you know calling on the serpent or the snake for help when someone is having um a, a dna sort of a, a recoding they're they're waking up to their um you know their mission and and becoming a healer themselves uh you know calling an elephant for support or a whale for moving through um deep emotions mm -hmm. uh you know a call in beaver i love to work with beavers one of my favorites uh who actually did okay. come through beavers through the heart and we just i mean you can't see a beaver and not be just like so happy to see a beaver yeah um, and the beaver is like really helping to clear the blocks and the dams and then shore up better boundaries for people and helping them with their with their field so yeah. a lot of times we as practitioners can be calling on specific animals for specific reasons calling in deer because this person really needs to feel a deeper level of compassion for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that this is a very powerful way that we can be easily utilizing animal guides in order to support our work when we're working with people one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. And it's funny. I, uh, we usually have, um, I don't know about you. It, I think this is probably true for you, but we usually have our go-tos, right? Like we've got our teams yeah. where I've, I've got my team of animal guides that I call upon usually. And then of course, whoever needs to show up for this particular person. Um, I noticed also, and Kat, you and I have talked about this. Uh, you get to know who your animal guides are. And then of course, you know, you get to know who the animal guides of your medicine family are. And there's usually a lot of overlap. It's yeah. so funny. I, I discovered this. I realized this a couple of years ago when I was speaking with a medicine sister of mine about, you know, she's kind of listing her primary totems and I'm listing my primary totems and we've got all these similar ones. And well, no wonder we get along so well because we're both in, and for you and I, Kat, like we're both in Hawk Tribe, right? We both hang out with the birds all day and we both have had significant experience with fox, for example. And uh, and spider now, you know, we just, you end up hanging out with people who have similar energetic flavors. Yeah. And that's really what it is, is like, who's on your team? Who, who um, I know a bunch of people who are all in bear clan together, like they all work with bear and they're all really, you know, and I don't know if they've had this conversation. I've just noticed, oh, you all hang out together and you all do similar work and you all have bear as a primary totem. Like, yeah, good. Exactly. And we find and each other. You would see this in different native uh, tribes where they would have the bear tribe people and the deer tribe people and the raccoon tribe. Like they would have these specific sort of little groups. And these people had that energy as their predominant sort of energy we're bringing. We still have that. So it's also interesting to start to see where your who your what your clients who your clients are. Um, recently, I had a retreat and it was hosted from my home. And I have, as you know, Michelle, um, the octopus in my living room and the octopus painting and the like. There's the two different octopus paintings. Okay, so there's and I had 
uh, several people who were there who had been working with me. We never talked about octopus, but they showed up and were like, oh my gosh, like octopus has been everywhere for me. This, you know, the past, like, while I've been working with you, there's been octopus has been showing up everywhere. This is so weird. Um, and it's not mm -hmm. weird. We are, um, we are, we are, you know, we're in these little clans together and we are assisting our, by learning our power animals and learning to work with them and our guides, they are going to be working on our clients with or without our knowledge. They're going to be showing up for them and bringing their medicine. So it actually, it, it makes our work so much easier <laughs> because we've got this, you know, elaborate team that are showing up and actually like helping people and i mean i'm so glad i have octopus because it's just like got all those arms and it's doing so much work <laughs> so smart good so, problem solving so smart <laughs> gosh oh man we could talk about this for a long time um i want to circle back a little bit to cat what you were mentioning about having physical representations of your animal guides. Yeah, That's please. another way that we can continue to deepen our relationship with them. So yes, there's the, once you discover who your animal guide is, what do you do with it? You know, how, how do you form that relationship? You talk to it, you meditate with it, you, uh, you know, dance it, move it, invite it into your body, uh, ask it what its mission is. You know, there's this whole, um, you know, it's like dating, right? Like it can your guides, right? And so, you know, for those of you who haven't read it, Kat, I'm sure it's up on your blog somewhere, right? People dating can go to it. Your, yeah, dating your energetics. Yeah. yeah, dating your energetics. Think about it like getting to know a new person in your life. We're like, okay, I'm going to spend time with this animal guide. I'm going to ask them what they like to do. What's your mission in life, right? And include them in your altar. Maybe, so for deer, you know, which is another one that Kat and I share, we both work a lot with deer medicine, and we both have deer antlers. Kat's got me beat significantly. She has deer antlers at the wazoo, and uh, she's so many antlers, and not even funny, I'm not kidding. And, uh, you know, but then you can honor, okay, I have a physical representation of part of deer medicine, and I'm honoring it, I'm placing it on my altar, I'm holding it, I'm uh, um, inviting it as one of the things that I like to do with antler is deer is a massively psychic totem. It's got these antenna up, right? And so working with, okay, how can I hold this and, uh, and really come into my own psychicness, my own antenna, so to speak, but then also many facets of deer, the relationship with family, right? The blending into the woods, the um, walking easily and through the snow and it's just like grace movement right there's many faces of deer medicine um, but you can honor that, that by the, the, having a physical representation painting your animal guides cat I know your octopus painting she's got this exquisite octopus painting that she's been working on for a very long time I uh, and I've got I made a medicine huh it's, it's done finally done yeah, yeah. It took a very long time, but it, it's totally worth it. It was totally beautiful. I made a medicine wheel with many of my, um, many of my animal guides on this medicine wheel. Um, you know, we collect feathers. Like somehow you manage to find feathers of all these random birds that, you know, I've got all these feathers now of all these different birds that I work with. And so many feathers. I mean, they, they literally fall out of the sky at me. Like, <laughs> um, and yeah, it's a ridiculous amount of, of other experience at my house. And, you know, I have all of these animal yeah. items. I don't purchase, uh, you know, cause I want to be conscious about, about stuff. I have kind of a hard time with purchasing um, animal parts that I'm not aware of their origins, where they're coming from, who they're coming from, um, how they were harvested. Um, so that's always something that we want to keep in mind um, because we don't want to be doing anything that's, you know, not in alignment with our values and honoring that animal. And somehow um, I, they, somehow they find you. They find you. <laughs> <laughs> won't go they find you so um i think it's really important yeah. these things of, of putting up images of having 
you know, little, little things and, and, um, you know, yeah. it's just like, I, you know, what do you, oh, look, it's, it's one in the <laughs> and I have uh -huh. my, uh, my, my owl on my phone, of course. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, these, these aspects, uh, we can, we can bring into our lives by forming these relationships, as you're saying, and, and dating them and, and playing within their realm and, and offering them our attention, which is our energy in creating this relationship as you would with any other guide or any other person that you wanted to hang out with. Yeah. Creating space for them in your life and in your practice too. You know, when you're saying to, by placing um, deer, a, a deer antler on your altar, you're saying to deer, there is a space for you in my life and in my work. And I welcome your presence here. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, and my altar, I mean, I've got a whole bunch of altars, one of which is almost entirely animal stuff, you know, again, that I, I didn't buy, it just came to me or people gave it to me or whatever. And so I've created space for my animal tribe saying, you are welcome here. Yeah. And I've had, um, you know, I wear this snake ring that you probably can't see, but I commissioned a beautiful snake ring because snake appeared to me so dramatically. And so I'm saying to snake, you are welcome here. I'm inviting you in. You have a presence in my life. You have a presence in my work. And I, have a snake I, ring too. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't have it on, but I usually am wearing my snake ring. You got one right behind you. Yeah. And I have been working with, um, I've loved working this, this year with, um, a beautiful white uh, deer skin that I place on my clients when I'm working on them. And then also with a small antler that just fits right on top of the heart. And I have, since I started working with those items, I mean, I, have, I, I just have fallen in love with this energy that they bring. And people have had just amazing heart openings and, and um, experiences with just these simple tools that are so supercharged with this energy, not only because it's connected, like it came from the animal, but because of our personal intention that's going into uh, the, the item, and connecting it, reconnecting it back to the energy of the animal. And mm -hmm. so for those of us who, I mean, we're not native, right? We're not going to be probably having an eagle feather um, that's not uh, actually legal in this country. But if we have a different feather and we, we cleanse it with smoke, we sit with it, we, we use our intention, our focus, to bring eagle energy into that feather, we can then start to use that as a totem in order to be able to also be working with that eagle energy um, with a, a physical feather object that we might not have access to, and that's okay. It doesn't mean that you can't um, still work with that energy in a physical form. Absolutely. Yeah, and I would say you, uh, you know, technically you don't need any physical representation of the animals at all. Not at all. You know, this is something that is, um, as with anything, and we've discussed this repeatedly, intention is your most powerful tool. So yes, I love that. Any feather can represent the energy of any bird or any bone can represent the energy of any animal, right? So to speak, or you don't even need anything at all, any physical representation, any indicator. Call upon the archetype itself, call upon your shared lineage, call upon your own DNA because you hold the vibration of that animal in you, in your own physical body, in your bones, right? So, and you know, even if you didn't, you still don't need that. So this is, it. Part, partially it's fun and Kat and I both like our, <laughs> our artifacts, right? You know, we both have, rooms full of all our beautiful healing tools that's just part of who we are part of our medicine is we like the the fun things but it is by no means necessary We're for work necessary and we always are uh encouraging uh people to not become too dependent on your tools 
They're amazing. They're fun. They're super helpful. They're amazing allies. And we can call upon the energy of those tools if we don't have them near us. Uh, it doesn't mean that you're not protected or not cared for or if you don't have specific things on you. So Yeah, or can't access the medicine of that animal, but it doesn't mean that at all. Yeah. Um, nope. So, so, all right. We probably wrap this up, even though I think that we could definitely talk for a couple more hours and share a lot more stories about amazing animals that we've um, been working with over the years. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. I feel like uh, a conversation about animal guides uh, via our Facebook page. We would love to hear from you. Maybe you have an amazing story to tell us. Uh, or if you have any questions that, that maybe we didn't hit on your question that you showed up for, you can reach out to us via our Facebook page, Shaman Sister Sessions, or send us an email to shamansistersessions at gmail.com. If you are interested in taking part maybe in Michelle's super deep animal dive, or, you know, I know Michelle isn't doing a lot of work with animals, but I will tell you that if you or someone you know has an issue with a pet um, and is, you know, struggling with something, Michelle is an amazing animal communicator. In, in 15 minutes, she can generally give you a great outline to what a problem is that's going on. Maybe you're, you're not sure how to uh, get a handle on and then solutions and and course of action from there we are very excited to be back after our brief break we'll be back next week tuesday at noon pacific michelle do what's our topic next week do we know next week we have a special guest my friend and colleague tony reynolds who will be visiting from the east coast uh, we haven't yet determined exactly what we're talking about. I gave her a handful of options and also told her, hey, whatever you want to talk about. So, um, But she is a wonderful speaker. She's a minister, and she has traveled the world, uh, you know, working with the church in various facets uh, through her travels and through working, um, you know, she did a lot of work in the Dominican Republic. She just got back from this trip to Greece and Rome, and uh, she has... Um, I heard her speak. Actually, I met her at that conference that I spoke at in May, and she gave a really amazing lecture about working with the ancestry, and particularly for her ancestry, she was talking about the Yoruba tradition. So regardless, whatever we talk about next week, it's going to be amazing because we'll have a really spectacular guest, Tony yeah. Reynolds. Can't wait to have that conversation with her. Mm -hmm. um, and we are very excited that as of this week, we will have all of our past episodes, not only on YouTube at Shaman Sister Sessions, but also on iTunes and Stitcher. So if you're a fan, if you love us, if you think we're amazing, please go and give us thumbs ups and uh, rate our episodes and give us reviews because that's always oh, helpful. And this is part of our great deep love of service to um, both, you know, people who are going through the awakening process, but also to healers and other uh, shamans and guides that are on the path. So we appreciate any support that you might offer in that area. And we are, once again, Michelle Hawk and Catherine Bird, so grateful to be here with you. And we look forward to hearing from you, maybe about some of your animal experiences. And we will see you next week. Woo. Thank you.